turn to John chapter four with the time that I have left. And we'll try to give attention to a passage that is maybe left ignored at times, but I think there's something for God to show us in his word. And he promises that his word never returns void. And so we trust that this morning. Now, if you're a parent, you know that there are very few things that you would not do for your child if they were in danger or if their life was in jeopardy. Months back, maybe some of you are familiar with the situation that we had with our daughter, Scotty. It was a scary week for us. We had been told that Scotty had a rare syndrome. We looked at that syndrome on Google and the first question that pre-populates is how long does the child live with such and such syndrome? One of the things that they say that these children experience is that they have strokes and seizures and by the time they're 18 months, it's possible that they, they die and our hearts sank. And I remember calling Wayne and a couple months after getting that diagnosis, Katie called me and she told me, Johnny, it's, it's Scotty. You know, her eyes are rolled back in her head. She's not breathing. Uh, she's limp. She's not responding. And it's been a long time. And we rushed her to the ER. And I remember at the medical center, uh, we got calls from different people in the church and they just said, Johnny, be adamant that they take you to Vanderbilt. Be adamant. No one cares for your child like you do. Be adamant, be adamant, be persistent. And then when we got transferred to Vanderbilt and you know, I had a woman that was there in the neurology department. She just came and said, hey, can I tell you something? Uh, no one loves your child like you do. So you be persistent. You push for answers. You push for clarity. Be adamant. Don't, don't feel like you're stepping on anybody's toes. Be persistent. And um, I was. <laughs> I, I was persistent. I would have done anything, right? Wouldn't you? If you're a mom or a dad. Thankfully, after several days in the hospital, the, the diagnosis was somewhat dismissed and Scotty remained stable and we monitor her seizure, maybe tendencies or propensities. But the point I'm trying to convey is that there is no telling what a father or a mother will do for their babies. Um, there, there also may be no desperation like that of a parent trying to seek the well-being of a child who is ill. Now, you don't have to be a parent to maybe think back to a time in your life when you were desperate for an answer, desperate for a solution. It doesn't matter whether you have 10 children or if you have none. The reality of this world is that sooner or later, you will encounter tragedy in your life. Whatever your academic, financial, reputational, or experiential report card might say, there is a common denominator in this life and that is difficulty and pain are soon coming. Job 5 says, For hardship does not spring from the soil, nor does trouble sprout from the ground. Yet man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. I've been to a lot of campfires. I've seen a lot of campfires. It kind of comes with the territory when you work at a camp. I don't know a lot about fires. I'm not a pyro expert, but I knew, do know one thing. Sparks fly upward. And Job says, as surely as sparks fly upward, in your life and in my life, we are going to encounter trouble. And in our trouble, we at times feel like we are gasping for hope and desperate for peace. And we're going to see such desperation from a father in our passage today. And then we are going to observe what is the ultimate basis of comfort in the midst of trouble. I want to read our passage in John chapter four, verses 43 through 54. It says, after two days, he went forth from there into Galilee for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. Therefore, he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. As he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. Then they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole house believed. This is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. 
I want to give you maybe five groups of people, five individuals as we make our way through this passage. First, if you're taking notes, I want you to observe with me the crowd in verses 43 through 45. There's a couple different interesting dynamics at play in this passage, and there appears to be a seeming contradiction. In verse 44, Jesus says that no prophet is welcome in his hometown. He's just drawing back to an Old Testament truth that the people that most rejected the prophets were the people from the prophet's hometown. They would have thought, who does this guy think he is? He grew up with us. Now he thinks he has the authority to be able to speak to us on behalf of God. And yet in the following verse, we're going to read that the Galileans were those who were welcoming Jesus. So Jesus says, a prophet's not welcome in his hometown. And then the next verse says they were coming to him and welcoming him. What's the solution? Well, the answer is in the reality that the people in Jesus' hometown, they welcomed Jesus as a sign giver, not as the savior of the world. They were drawn to Jesus because they were spectators. They wanted Jesus to entertain them. They wanted Jesus to feed them. They wanted Jesus to do something for them. He, they wanted Jesus to give something to them. They weren't interested in what Jesus would do in them. They welcomed Jesus for what he did, but they would ultimately reject, spurn, and then slaughter him for what he said. Secondly, now I want to look with you at the man, the man that comes to Jesus beginning in verse 46. It says that there is this royal official in 46b whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, if we're drawing our memories back to the wedding at Cana, John wants us to understand that this is the second sign that Jesus will perform in this same area, which means he wants us to think about the similarities of these two miracles. And there's a couple similarities on the surface. The first of which is that both of these signs are going to be prefaced by an initial rebuke of the one who asks for the sign. Remember, Mary in John chapter two will say, hey, there's no more wine. And Jesus will rebuke her and say, woman, it is not my hour yet. Secondly, both of these miracles are performed at a distance. Sometimes we think about Jesus's power and we think that he had the Midas touch. You know, he had to be there. But the reality of scripture is that Jesus could do whatever he wants with whomever he wants, wherever he wants from a distance. So there's some similarities here. But the main thing that John wants us to understand is that there's one main distinguishing factor between these two events. In John chapter two, a sign takes place in the context of great joy and great merriment. And in John chapter four, a sign takes place in the context of profound sorrow, pain, and desperation. In any event, John wants you to understand something about Jesus. Whatever the situation might be, the person you want and the person you need is Jesus Christ. He is always the answer, whether or not the wine is running out or the life is running out of your beloved son. Archibald Campbell once remarked, if we invite Jesus to our times of happiness, he will increase our joy. And if we call on him in our times of sorrow, anxiety, and bereavement, he will bring us consolation, comfort, and joy that is not of this world's. In John chapter one, John the Baptist remarked that Jesus is the savior of the world. And throughout these different stories we'll observe in John's gospel, we'll also examine that he's the savior of every circumstance and season and event in our life. He gives us what we most need, even if it's not always what we most want. Wherever there is true joy, Jesus brings it all the more. And wherever there is true sorrow, Jesus brings comfort and peace that he alone can provide. Now, the man that comes to Jesus, it would have been an unlikely character if you were a Jewish individual. He is a royal official, which means that he would have been a part of Herod's household. He would have occupied a place of preeminence and prominence. He would have been wealthy. He would have been Intelligence, intelligent. He would have had a large reputation. You could refer to this guy as a vice president or a secretary of defense. But we see here that he is coming to Jesus because he would have traded everything back that he has if he could replace it and trade it for a healthy son. This is what so often happens in our life. We have our personal priorities revealed by our circumstances. This guy has everything he wants, but the one thing that he wants, he cannot solve. That being the, son, the health of his son. Now, he comes to Jesus and his face is red and sweaty and 
maybe even tearful because he makes about a 16 to 20 mile journey from his home to where Jesus is at in Cana. And it says that he comes to him in verse 47, part B, and was imploring him. That word for implore is not like, hey, Jesus, heard a lot about you. You seem like a nice guy, got a favor to ask you. No, this is the language of begging. This is the language of please, tugging on the robe. I need you, please, please. Jesus, Jesus, my son, my son. You have to understand, his name is this. He's only this, years old. Please, Jesus. He would have traveled about four hours. And he's under the same impression as Jairus, the man who had his daughter healed because Jairus was under the assumption that only if Jesus came back to his house that his daughter could be healed. Now, this man doesn't assert his position. He's not trying to pull rank on Jesus. He doesn't say, hey, you don't, don't you have any idea who I am? Right now I'm using nice language, but in a minute I'll use demanding language. No, he, he's not doing any of that. He knows his authority is nothing compared to the man before whom he stands. He's crying out for mercy. He's desperate for help. Let's look third at the response of the savior. Jesus responds in verse 48. Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. He's putting everyone into the same bucket. They are curiosity seekers. They want to watch the show that is Jesus Christ. They want what Jesus can provide for them in the material and physical realm, not in the spiritual and eternal realm. They're there. Grab the peanut butter M&Ms, grab the popcorn, salt it. Jesus, put on a show for us. Then we'll believe, then we'll believe. And they're trying to coax him to do more signs. And then they'll say, well, just prove to us, prove to us, prove to us who you think you are. This is so emblematic of the way many people preach today in the prosperity church. You know, even if you come to Jesus, all your problems will go away. Joel Osteen says in his best-selling book, Your Best Life Now, Start calling yourself healed, happy, whole, blessed, and prosperous, and you'll be that. Stop talking to God about how big your mountains are and start talking to your mountains about how big your God is. You can claim your blessings that come from God. Joel Osteen tells his church, start seeing your bright future, and once you start seeing it, God will bring it. Start imagining your dreams come true, and you're halfway there. God wants you to have a good life and your faith activates the power of God. Meaning that God is impotent unless we place our faith in him. So we must come to him in faith so that he can give us our best life now. This is the way many of the people came to Jesus. They were interested in Jesus purely out of self-interest. What will Jesus do for me? They didn't come to him as savior. They didn't submit to him as Lord. They want signs. They're spectators. They're fans sitting on the bleachers. They had created a God in their own image. Now, why does Jesus respond this way about the signs? After all, in John 10, 38, Jesus will say, if you don't believe me, believe in the works that I do in my father's name meaning that the signs were authenticating credentials to his identity and power. But there's always a difference in scripture between Jesus strengthening weak faith and him entertaining those who had no desire to listen to him, but simply wanted to spectate. The signs were indeed a place to start, but not a place to end. Now, how does this man respond in verse 49? Let me just give you the answer. With persistence. The royal official said to him, sir, Come down before my child dies. There's something to say about this. I've mentioned before that we are saved by the simple gaze of faith. But Jesus will say in Luke 18, there, there is something to say about the persistence of our faith. And even in our prayer with the Lord, in verse 50, Jesus responds to the man's persistence and says, go, your son lives. Now this may seem on the surface, distant and cold, but we know it's not distant and cold because 
Jesus, John will say, in him we saw the fullness of grace upon grace. C.S. Lewis says in his book, Surprised by Joy, the hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men. Jesus' blunt, succinct words here were meant to soften his heart so that he could place his faith wholly and solely in God, not in the signs that God performed. You know, in the physical world, we abide by the proverb, seeing is what? Believing. But here, according to Jesus, the opposite is true. The way he, we see who God is, is by believing in him. And once we believe in God, we begin to see the breadth of his goodness, love, and power. This noble man right here is charged to do the inverse of the way the world and the natural man think. He is called to believe in order that he may see. Following Jesus' words, he does not ask for a deposit or a proof, or hey, if that's really true, uh, turn that rock into a piece of bread so I know you really have the power. No, what does it say? 50B, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. He exhibits the mark of all true faith. Do you know what that is? What's the mark of true faith? Taking Jesus at his word. We can use big words, many syllables. Uh, you can use complex language. I could give you doctrinal definitions. But at the end of the day, faith can be consolidated for a believer of trusting and taking Jesus at his word. Jesus says in John 8, 56, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. What does that mean? Well, Abraham's belief and faith in the promises of God were so strong that he saw the day that Jesus would come. Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things, anybody know? Not seen. What is faith? The assurance of things not seen. And in 51, the idea is that the man so believed Jesus that he went about his business. He had come desperate, agitated, urgent, and despairing, and now he is sauntering off as if he doesn't have a care in the world. We'll examine this more in a moment, but let's look forth at the child. Verse 51. As he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better, and then they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Why does he inquire about the time? Well, very simple, right? He wants to time, line up the timing of the miracle with the timing of Jesus' words. And what does he discern? Well, he discerns that it happened yesterday at the seventh hour, which would be one o'clock. Why does this matter? Well, because this man had came, or come to Jesus hustling and bustling, crying, sweaty, and traveled four hours to Jesus. And Jesus tells him at one o'clock the previous day, go, your son lives. Now, at that point, if you're a father, you're likely gonna run home and you're gonna be home at what time? What's one plus four hours? I mean, come on. Uh, it's five o'clock in the afternoon. Let me help you out here. Okay, um, five o'clock. Um, it's five o'clock in the afternoon. That guy could have got home, seen his son, give him a noogie. I don't know if that's still a thing. Eaten dinner with his family and slept in his own bed. But the idea here is that his trust in the promises of God were so sure that he went about his business and he came home the following day. And he lined up the timing of the miracle with the timing of Jesus' words. John wants to convey the fact that this man's trust was so deep, his anxiety was gone. He didn't rush home, his burden was removed. Why? Because he took Jesus at his word and then he realizes that the sign is not the product of coincidence, but the act of divine providence because God never wants to share his glory. And anything that is in the realm of coincidence, God routinely will never operate there but in the realm of 
Only God. Only God. Fifth, I want to look with you in the final verses at the family in verses 53 and 54. So the father knew it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives, and he believed, and his whole house believed. This is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. The whole family believed. Why? Well, I think for one main reason, well, obviously the sovereignty of God, the gift of God, but I think what you have here is a father that believes the word of Jesus. Before they had ever seen the signs of Jesus, here's a father who believed the word of Jesus and his faith is in the right order. Remember what it says in Romans 10, faith comes by, anybody know? Hearing. And when you believe in God, it says the blessed in heart, the pure in heart shall see God. At the end of the day, faith is not an expression of our personality. It is an expression of our trust in God's word. And can I tell you something about genuine faith as we observe here in this passage? Sooner or later, genuine faith always becomes a vocal. It's not a promise that every single one of your children is gonna get saved, but it is a promise that every believer's faith becomes vocal. And it is a general truth that in a culture, in cultures where the father is passionate about the words of Jesus, it does affect the household. If you wanna change a country, you have to change the households. A lot of that starts with dads who believe in the words of Jesus. Many people today have faith in faith. Many people today have faith in religion. But saving faith is only for those who come and trust in Jesus Christ. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, we've already examined the reality that we live in a fragile and fractured world. And if you want stability and serenity in a world of madness, you need to come to Jesus Christ who will save you of your sins and he'll give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. Would you stand with me as we pray? And I know we're nearing the time, but I'd love to close with one song. Lord, we thank you. And we praise you for your word this morning, always relevant. We never have to make the Bible contemporary. It's the most contemporary of books because it speaks to the human condition. And it speaks to what we long for is an unmovable God in turbulent times. And so, Lord, we love you. And we pray even now that we would be able to lift our voices to you. A godly church is a singing church. It's just at the end of the day, there's something to be said that gratitude leaks. It's obvious. And so Lord, I pray that we would express the gratitude of our hearts with our tongues even now. We pray this in your name. And all God's people said,